The Washington Post has called Mary Roach America's funniest science writer, and it's absolutely true. She's just hilarious. Uh, in her previous books, she has tackled subjects like the afterlife in Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, brought us answers to the questions Dr. Ruth never asked in Bonk, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex, and explored the universe of zero gravity in Packing for Mars, The Curious Science of Life in the Void. Mary applies her trademark wit and candor to taboo in her latest book, Gulp, Adventures on the Alimentary Canal, which discusses everything you wanted and everything you never wanted to know about digestion. The New York Times has said, Gulp is far and away her funniest and most sparkling book, bringing Ms. Roach's love of weird science to material that could, never ha that could not have more everyday relevance. Having graduated from corpses, the afterlife, and sex, she tacks on a subject wholly mainstream. She explores it with aneloid merriment, and she is fearless about the embarrassment that usually accompanies it. Joining Mary on stage is the equally hilarious and sharp-witted Jack Beware. So without further ado, please welcome Mary and Jack to the stage. Mary Roach, everybody. <laughs> Jack Boulevard, everybody. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Uh, if you uh, had picked up the New York Times today, you would realize that, of course, Mary Roach's book, Gulp, on the bestseller list. <laughs> Number two, first week on the list. Appropriately yeah. enough. <laughs> Oh, you're pouring us both water. I'm pouring you water. Excellent. You don't get Gosh. as much as I do, though. Wow. Did you pour Terry Gross water? No. It's hard to do from another room. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, be before we start talking about uh, Mary's new book, um, we've actually known each other a long time. And uh, I remember one of the first times I met Mary, she asked me, well, what are you working on? And I said, well, I'm, um, I'm writing about sumo wrestling in the Czech Republic. And this, this is a classic Mary Roach response. You said, oh, sumo wrestling. Oh, make sure to talk about the guys that are so fat they have to have an assistant to wipe their ass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's true. No, that's, it's true. And that, I think that combines a lot of Mary Roach in that <laughs> response. It's insanely gross. It's funny. There's some scientific, you know, physics involved. And, uh, and there's a bit yeah. of travel. So that's right. I think that all worked out really well. Um, so uh, and did you did you did you ask them? No, I think it was after I uh, they, no, they, and they weren't fat in the Czech Republic. They were oh, they weren't fat. That's you had the, guys. the yeah. scrawny sumo wrestlers. Yeah, so yeah. I've they, heard they about were, them. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't need any assistance in uh, in that regard. Um, so uh, given that you love uh, you know this inappropriate science. Uh, I wanted to see, you know, w when you were a child, you grew up in New Hampshire. <coughs> New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yes, sir. Um, were you the type of kid, I'm guessing here, that you would come to the dinner table and say, hey, everybody, I just ate a maggot. I mean, were you, were you like, you know, uh, 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 did, you, were, did you have a love of the visceral as a child? Curiously enough, uh, my dad, my dad was a pretty easygoing guy, but the one thing he would not abide was belches or farts, particularly at the dinner table, you would be spanked. Wow. You would be spanked. Tough so, love. Yeah, so uh, possibly. And the, uh, the only other thing, yeah, and, and, and also you weren't allowed to swear. And the I remember the first time I swore, I did it like an idiot at the dinner table. Yeah. We're sitting at the table, and our little family, my brother and me and my parents, and I was in, I think, second grade or third grade, and out of the blue, I said, having no idea what it meant, my brother's name is Rip, by the way, I said, Rip is a fucker. <laughs> and I was hauled off and spanked, and spanked. Really? Yeah. So, in, yeah. be in, in between courses. <laughs> yeah, there was, like, there was no, like, maybe after we're done eating, it was put down the knife and fork. And in, wow. Yeah. So did, where did yeah. your sort of love of, you know, this kind of information develop then? 
Were well, you, you, uh, you know, I, I do have some... Were your parents science inter interested in science? Or were uh, they... No, 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 no. My parents were... My dad was a theater guy. My dad was a speech and theater, and my mom was a secretary. But I did, I have, people have asked me this before, and I do have some memories. Like, I was, um, I didn't have dolls. I had little dinosaurs that, from the Natural History Museum. And someone gave me, at one point, a Barbie doll. The only time I had a doll, and what I did with it was I would pull the head off and give myself 10 seconds to get the head back on or she dies. <laughs> So, wow. Which, if you've read Stiff, is actually kind of accurate. Wow. You Basically, get ten it back second on. rule. Yeah. Ten second rule. Right. Yeah. You're on. You know. You wow. could still survive that. That's nice. Uh, no, no Ken dolls. That just a. Just it was a Barbie. just a Barbie. Yeah, with wow. a black perm. And, nice, uh, nice. Yeah. I remember as a kid, we would use uh, silly putty. Uh, playing with GI Joes, we'd use silly putty for brains, because it uh, it looked like brains. What do you mean? You break open the head? Uh, no, you just like glob it around like he'd just been shot. Oh, Look at all the shot. great oh, brains. Oh, okay. you know? <laughs> I don't know. Interesting. We're getting a little too personal. I'm sorry. Uh, let's get back on track. Interesting. <laughs> so uh, so you're, you're, uh, you're, what gave you the sense that you wanted to be a writer? Why did you move to San Francisco? Uh, you had it all. Yeah. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. You had it all. You had no. uh, mini Ivy League school. The, yes. The one, the, the little three, the Wesleyan. Little three. It's so pathetic. You go to, to Wesleyan University or or Amherst or Williams, the other two of the little three, and you 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 say to people, you're like, oh, where'd you go to school? And you go, oh, Wesleyan University, and then you get a blank stare, and you go, it's one of the little three. It's so oh, pathetic. Excellent. It's we one feel of the so little sorry three. For you. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost an Ivy League. So you yeah. could have had it all. Um, no, you know, I graduated and I didn't have any plans. Uh, I'd be, well, I, I was a liberal arts major. I don't have a science background and I had no job skills. And 1981, when I graduated, was a pretty severe recession. Right. So uh, Reagan. Pff, yeah. I had nothing going on. I did a drive away car. I don't know if drive, do drive away cars still exist where people trusting stupid people would <laughs> give their cars over to college students who would yeah. go run across them, the United States, go across the United States, right. trash them. Right. Uh, try to and then you'd never have to return it. You just return it at wherever you arrived, right? Wasn't that you, it? You would, you would, yeah. Somebody had moved across, flown cross country with their belongings or whatever, right. and you would, you and your buddies would take this car cross country and then deliver it, trying to sort of glue the rearview mirror back on and clean it up as best you could. And that's, so that's what brought you to that's the West what, Coast. I came out with some friends who were going to Berkeley that summer, and I. Berkeley, dude. Bit, dude. I, I heard you know, someone said, oh, San Francisco, there's this thing called dim sum, where they, where they wheel around a cart with yeah. these amazing weird foods, and that was the most exotic thing to me at the time. Wow. I, I think I came out here for, for dim, dim sum. sum. Nice. And then, of course, you learn, sum. after a while, you learn that the, the rude wave, if you don't want it, <laughs> in a dim sum restaurant, if somebody brings you, like, yeah, 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 I love exactly. That. Yeah, the rude exactly. Wave. So, uh, so you, uh, you'd finished school, and I, I, we're, uh, at Lickwake, we do this thing called Regretterature, a show every year, <laughs> and uh, we ask people to come in and read from the worst stuff they've ever written, and Mary did the show last year, and it was a piece, I think it was one of the first things you'd ever have published. Yes. And it was... Uh, it, it was from the... Uh, I had a, a job in the PR office of the SPCA in San in Francisco, San Francisco? Yeah. and part of my duty was to write it was a column that was in the examiner called Pet Tips. <laughs> pet Tips. Anybody remember Pet, pet tips? tips? No, probably no, not. Not one. Quite a while ago. Anyway, yeah. and uh, I read from a, a Pet Tips column called Guppy Love. Yeah. Which was Guppy Love. Uh, encouraging people to not use guppies as feeders for other fish, but to raise them as pets. That right. It's trying to make the case that guppies were a fascinating pet <laughs> right. all by and, themselves they, yeah and i not. wish i could remember the first line uh, I, I remember the last line let's hear it for guppies, guppies. <laughs> yeah let's that's right so let's hear i think it was one of those i gotta wind these i gotta wind yeah. this up i gotta end this somehow okay so Let, let's hear it for guppies, guppies. yay guppies. yeah guppies and, but the thing is i saved that clip for many i was proud in at, the, at that period of time, that represented, yeah. like, I was proud of that clip. Yeah. This, I started below the bottom of the ladder. I, the first thing I wrote was for not even a newspaper, but the fake advertising supplement that, you know, like, 
home safety, which is basically just a way to sell advertising to burglar alarm companies and German shepherd training companies. And, and then it would be filled with horrible, cheesy, unpaid writing. And right. I, I wrote one piece that I, you know, for some advertising supplement, and I remember showing my roommates, I lived in the hate, the corner of hate and Ashbury, showing them, look, I'm published. I'm a writer. I was so, I was proud of that. Wow. But if you, if you start at the bottom, you're always, there's nowhere to yeah. go but up. So everything is always good. <laughs> I feel sorry for people who start at the top. I do too. It's just. I do too. They're terrible. Um, it's a scourge. <laughs> uh, but, the, the, so, uh, 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 uh after a while, you started writing travel stuff. That's, I think, is when I first met you. You were flying all over the place. And they even, one magazine even put you on the cover, uh, and it was at the Tomato Festival oh, somewhere yeah, in Europe. Yeah, and it was you on the cover, splattered with tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, there's a festival called La Tomatina, which is uh, this little town in Spain where they, 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 the, the tomatoes, I guess they have a surplus because they these tanker trucks come in with tomatoes and they unload them into the streets of this little town. Right. And it's, it's a massive uh, tomato fight. And, it's, and at the, in the end of it, there is a, the streets are that deep in and just pulp. Mush. It's mush. And, yeah. and, and you, anything goes. Oh, no, no. You have to, actually, you have to crush them in your hand first because some of them are a little unripe. They don't want anybody to get hurt. But anyway. Right. So, yeah, the tomato No, fight. I remember thinking, wow, the, they put the writer on the cover of this magazine. That's, of they course, did, my yeah. perspective, like, geez, wow, pretty cool. It was a little hard to wreck. I was lying down, almost submerged in tomato pulp, so <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. it, it, it could have been it anybody. It could have been anybody. That's true, <laughs> that's true. Uh, so when you did your first book, Stiff, I, uh, I read recently that uh, you were kind of challenged to do a book. Yeah, that, that book, well, I... Uh, it's your first book with the classic opening book. line about... The human, the human head, head weighs... is the same approximate size and weight as a roaster chicken, I think was the first line of that book. Something like that, um, right. Because the heads were in roaster pans at right. the time. People are going, what? I, what? Uh, this, this thing just disintegrated. It seemed to be going <laughs> so, so well. Suddenly and heads, now, what? The heads uh, were in roaster. It was a plastic surgery practice session, and each person who had paid the amount of money to go and learn these techniques had a head, and they put them in a, um, the kind of thing you would put a roaster chicken. You'd pick it up at the... Walgreens or whatever, or aluminum, because right. they're about the same size. Right. Anyway, where were we um, going? Let's uh, see. Okay, yes, uh, the, no, the that book, of the book grew out of, yeah, I, I, I wrote that book partly because I used to be in the grotto, as you, uh, you know. San Francisco Writer's Grotto. The San Francisco grotto. Writer's Grotto, and uh, three of us there would go every New Year's, we'd go and we'd make, we'd go out to lunch and make predictions for the next year where people would be. Um, personal life, career, and someone made a prediction for me that I would have a book contract. And so, uh, flat, fast forward to October, and I, this, I realized you know, that in, in a few months we're gonna go to lunch and we're gonna read through the list of predictions from the previous year, and someone would go, oh, Mary Roach, no, doesn't have a book contract. So I thought, okay, I've got two months. So I, I, that is what I, I did it to, out of a desire to avoid a humiliating. <laughs> Uh, humiliating it lunch. It was just. It was fear that, dro that it, drove you to put, a, put it, your first it, book basically. together. Basically, and I and around the same time, I got a, a fortune cookie fortune that said, "Try something new." That also. It was that random. Wow. It was that random in a conversation with an agent around that time. I was writing a column for Salon.com, and he uh, said, "Well, what columns got the highest hit rates?" And uh -huh. the, there were a couple of cadaver. Death. Research right. related, mm -hmm. so that's how it happened. Pretty, just fairly random. Not, wow. a, I, you know, I'm, I, it's not like it was a lifetime interest <laughs> of mine, which people assume with your first book that you are writing not because you make are trying to make a living as a writer, but because of a passion right. to surround yourself in I this. I just love cadavers. I just all I want to do. All the time. My whole life, I wanted to write about <laughs> cadavers, <laughs> with, to, and that's what people think. Right, but after two or yeah. three years, you're like, okay. Got it with the cadavers. Let's see what else is out there. Yeah. Um, the, one of the things that's interesting about your books, and I, I love them all. I haven't read them all, but I love them all. Is that, <laughs> you like, I the, think you like read, the covers? I read most of them. Uh, <laughs> and they're, they're, there's this fascination uh, that I see you have with, uh, first of all, facts. Love, yeah. lovely facts. Some yeah. of the most amazing facts but that have ever been. But only special facts. 
but they're, yeah. they're facts that, that you, I would think as you stumble upon them in your research, you'd want to tell someone right away. Yeah, right. And do you do that, or do you bottle it up and wait for the book to come out? I bottle it, I, I do, I bottle it up, and uh, yeah, I, I just have this desire for it to kind of be fresh. I don't know why I, I just, you know, if I tell someone they're gonna remember that two or three years down the line, we, you know, read through it, oh, tch. I knew that. I mean, nobody's going to remember, but I yeah. have this sense of wanting it to be. Because I, uh, particularly now with the internet, I, ha I, I feel like it's uh, it's so hard to find material that isn't hasn't. If it's interesting or funny or or whatever it is, I f it's you sort of have to assume it's out there yeah. on the internet. So when I find something that's not that seems sort of fresh and special, I kind of like guard it right, and right. try to keep it fresh and then spring it upon the public when exactly. the book comes out. No one will know no this. No one will know this. With this piece of trivia yes. about fart gas until <laughs> it's time. Yes. Uh, so uh, another thing that uh, I, I think is fascinating is that you would, when you, you interview a lot of scientists in all of your books, you yeah. make pilgrimages yeah. uh, to these, these experts in their fields and you're kind of making them famous in a way, but they're, they're also is this unsuppressed glee I see in your writing where yeah. you're like, I'm following, you know, someone in a manure patch, <laughs> and we're gonna, you know, milk a goat, or we're gonna poke a dead body, or something. And there's right. just something, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I think that's part of the joy of your books is this glee. Yeah, don't you feel I that think way? that. Uh, oh, yeah, for sure. And but it's a mix. Some some of the scientists are just odd that anybody wants to be there in the lab. For example, for, in Gulp, I spent some time. In the, uh, with re some researchers who do, it's a very small sliver of science called oral processing. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with what goes on in your mouth when you are forming a bolus to, you know, you're creating, you take food apart and then you reform it into the swallowable state. And it, so there's this all, there's people who did the unbelievable level of detail that's gone into studying this. These people do not expect an email saying, I'd like to travel all the way to the <laughs> Netherlands to come to your lab. They're not, they're not accustomed to this, and sometimes they're frightened, and other times they're delighted. Um, and then there are people like Michael Levitt, who is the flatus expert. This man has, right. okay, he's published 34 papers on yeah. flatus. He started out, it was as a resident, and he said, when I was a resident, the gas chromatograph had just come into use, and no one had yet applied it, They'd, no one had had the, the idea or the nerve, I guess you could say, to apply it to human flatus. Right. So his advisor said, well, I think you should do this because you're kind of an incompetent in this way. At least it'll be, <laughs> it'll be new and you'll get it published. And he did, he had he papers did. on flatulence in the New England Journal of Medicine, right. 34 papers. But then at a certain point, Michael Levitt got very tired of being associated with, with farts. Yeah. And um, That was a sad day for science a, when he did. <laughs> And he moved on, and he's like, when you, so when you go to see Michael Levitt, you go Is to- Is he still involved in the study of flatus? No, he's, he's not, but he made the mistake of agreeing to see me when I, I but I, you know, I had to email him three or four times. Right, he, because, because he's the king of flatus. He's the king of flatus. And you have you, to talk to him. And if you go on, if you, at one point I couldn't remember what he looked like, if he had gray hair or red hair, and so I wrote in Google Images, I put Michael Levitt, and, uh, I, this is true. In Google Images, one of the first images was a can of baked beans. <laughs> so, the poor That's guy, his legacy. He he's never, stuck with it. Yeah, he's, and he's done all. And so he, you go to see him, and he goes, "You know, I've done a lot of other. I've done a lot of other work. Um, yeah. You know, I invented the breath hydrogen test, and I've done a lot of work with the villi, the you know, the small intestine and intestinal stirring, and in which you know helps with new absorption of nutrients. And so I'm like, and I asked right. a, a requisite number of questions about intestinal stirring, and right. then I said. By the way, um, do you think I, we could see the mylar flatus trapping pantaloons, <laughs> which he had invented and had made these? And, these are pants that, that would trap, would trap gas, gas yes. for, and my, for later study. For study, because right. if you're going to study flatus, you have to trap it. You have to catch it. You at have its to moment. catch it. <laughs> yes, it's a fleeting thing, and you've got to. <laughs> Somehow trap it, and right. mylar is airtight, so the mylar. mylar. So what color are these pants? They're they're t they're like tinfoil color. It looks tin there's foil. a there's a photograph. He couldn't find them. This killed me. I'm like I went all the way to Minneapolis, and you can't find the. 
You're the Milas king of farts. Flayed our, he should have them trapping. like prominently displayed exactly. in his office. Yeah, so they, we looked through the storeroom for a while, and there's lots of interesting things down there, but not yeah. the Mylar flatus trapping pantaloons, though he did produce a photograph from the 80s. It was a very, uh, a very 80s looking um, picture of this woman with their kind of looked like tinfoil knickers. Yeah. 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 Kind of like a 80s MTV video almost in a mm-hmm. way. It's very much of its time. Yeah. Yeah. Today yeah. there would be so, like, I don't know, uh, maybe they'd have like snap button plaid, you know, a little hipster. Anyway, where some, are we going? Something with like this? that. I don't but know. anyway, so he, yeah, Michael, so, so Michael Levitt, he was nice enough to talk to me that afternoon, but then. Um, at a certain point, he stopped returning my emails. I have no idea what he thought of the book. I think he's, I, he's just, t- he's tired of it. Yeah. And now, and now, of course, it. with this whole round of publicity for Gulp, his name is coming up over and over in relation to flatulence. People. Yes. And people are now yet calling him, I'm sure, again. So what? Like, uh, oh, Mary Roach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the fart king anymore. I Intestinal do- stirring. Ask me about that. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you get, uh, what is the blowback from the science community after your books come out? It's Are, funny because blowback is actual, uh, actually I didn't, a technical I swear to God, I didn't, wasn't term thinking. if you're trying to use one, like a, a, a flatulence odor reducing cushion, you get rectal gas, oh it's blow, it's yeah, blow, blow, back. blow, uh, blow by. Blow Sorry. by. Yeah. It's good to know though. Yeah, it's those, good to have. It's good. <laughs> Anyway, sorry. What? Anyway, no, yeah. the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, now, the after blowback. effect, the sorry. after effect yes. of, uh, of your book's uh, publication uh, and what that does to the characters. Because you make your most people when they write a book, they're like, okay, I interview the scientist, I get the facts I need, and I continue on with my narrative. They, they're characters in your books. Yeah, right. You, you get to see what they look like, what they eat for lunch. I mean, you know, any sort of like characteristics about them. They, they actually become part of the narrative and. You know, are, have you had nasty letters? Are they like all proud of you know being featured in your books? People, the, the scientists are incredibly good-natured, mm-hmm. good sports for the most part. Black um, humor. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, for, you, I, and I'm always nervous about because I don't typically send the chapter for review. I'll sometimes go over facts with a, with somebody that I've interviewed, but I don't usually give them the entire chapter right. to, to review because that way madness lies. Yeah. You know, I thought we were going to, I was hoping you'd talk about, and I don't think I was wearing that, and you know, it's, it, 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 people focus on things that they won't focus on when the book is out, and, right. and they see it, they're like, oh, I can deal with this, this is okay. Right, but if but they saw just that if chapter, they, they If would... they had the opportunity to make a lot of changes. They would. They would. They yeah. probably would. But I, 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 I like, to, in response to that question, my favorite reaction, there was a, um, for Spook, which was uh, a book about people trying to use scientific method to investigate the soul or the afterlife. Uh, and there was a, a guy in India, a Dr. Rawat, and he, he was looking into cases of alleged reincarnation. He would go to little villages and talk to people who think that a, you know, a small child is the reincarnation of somebody who died that same day. Anyway, so it was, uh, the, the, there were some, I sent the book to, to Dr. Rawat and I got this note, lovely note back, because he's a poet also. And he said, marry your book, is like a bouquet of roses, many flowers and leaves, and a few thorns. So Aww. I thought that was, that was a lovely... Um, That's a great yeah. book blurb <laughs> yeah. on the back of a book at some point. People yeah, pro- yeah no. Uh, so w- when did you realize that this sort of uh, was kind of your, your specialty? Was it after the first book? And then you realize, oh, all of my you know, passions are kind of included in this. You know, uh, eccentric scientists. Right. You know, travel. Gr- travel, Sun. grisly, gross facts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> about uh, something involving the human body. Uh, well, it, it is kind of a. Uh, it seems to work for me. I think every absolutely. time, every time I do a, a book, I think, well, maybe, uh, maybe I'll do some sort of a departure, and I'll do like more of a narrative, a sweeping narrative, or something. Mm. Um, more grown up or something more less sciencey and, and then Spartacus I'll st- by Mary Roach <laughs> <laughs> and then I do, and then I, I just don't I don't come up with those ideas the ideas I come up with are oh god I, like Matt like Bonk was really the, the, the sex lab book was one day I was reading film quarterly of all things I don't know how I came to be very reading. sexy. Yeah, film quarterly. I, and there was a reference to the colposcopic films of Masters and Johnson. And I went, colposcopic? Isn't that the cervix? And does this mean what I... And I looked up a little bit about Masters and Johnson, and lo and behold, they had made films using a, a, 
a plexiglass phallus so they could film the female sexual response from the inside of the body, which is in the 50s an extraordinary thing to do. And I remember exactly at that moment going, sex research, next book. Here we go. Here we go, just perfect. Um, uh, and then there's no heading back, so. Wow, so, so do all of the books begin with a fact like that? No, 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 sometimes it's, it's, just, it's, it's uh, I have a, a, a cluster of things I would like to write about, like Gulp was really, there was a trip to Bino many years ago. Right, Bino, the, the Bino, the, does the, everyone know what Bino is? The drops that you put in your chili or your beans right. to sort of break down these um, carbohydrates so that they do, that doesn't happen in your colon, so you're less gassy. Right, anti-gas. Okay. Anti-gas anti uh, yeah, drops. Right. So Great name, though. Bino, Bino, yeah, Bino. So I was at the Bino. Bino has a lab where they do flatulence research. So do they know, have the a years... gift shop? Guess what? No. Guess what? No. No, but, but the, guy, uh, the, the guy who runs the place, uh, uh, Dr. Kligerman, gave me a Bino windbreaker. <laughs> nice. Nice. And I still have it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. With their logo yes. on it? Yes, Bino right here. Nice. Yeah. Does it have your name on the other side? No, like... it does not. It does not. <laughs> My name's Mary. I'm here to fix it. Like... Bino. <laughs> that's that's they, so great. They, yeah. They so, don't, but they should have a gift. So shop. you're going to the Bino Okay, so factory. Bino, I had, and this was a story I did years ago, and I had all this really fun stuff, and I couldn't use it because my editor didn't share my sensibilities <laughs> uh, and sense of humor. So I had this sort of sitting there, and then I also had some material from something I came across in Packing for Mars. and So I had a, so sometimes what I do when I come up with a book is like, here are four things I'd like to play with. What would be the umbrella topic? that could allow me to go there. So I right. kind of go back. I don't, I don't start with the idea. I start with the particulars. I, I'm mm -hmm. really ass backward when it comes to mm -hmm. my process and, and how I do books. But whatever works. The, uh, uh, the, the, there is some spacesuit information in Gulp that is, I've, yeah. I'm trying to think of, is this there's what the a, fact there's was? There's an activated sort of... charcoal filter in a spacesuit so that if the astronaut farts, it won't circulate past his nose every right. 10 seconds, right. which it otherwise would. So there's, right. a, there's a way to trap that odor. Right. Is that what you're talking about? So yeah I, yeah, I was thinking if you came across that fact and you had Bino research, it is kind of a natural connection. It is, yeah, yeah. Two. Well, in Packing for Mars, the, 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 the zero gravity toilet chapter, I, I mean, it, I have to say I outdid myself with that. I took, it, <laughs> I took it to levels that even I did not think was possible. <laughs> So, um, and that is, that's the chapter everybody talked about. Is that your favorite fact out of all the books? What fact? Uh, they're oh, just the, about the zero gravity uh, toilet. Oh, so many facts, so many facts in that chapter. But yeah, yeah, but yeah it, was, it was a lot of fun because it was, what I loved about it is it wasn't just, it wasn't just a sort of a tee hee topic. Um, the, the people who do the waste, man, the waste management engineers at NASA are responsible for morale to a larger extent than any, anybody realizes. When that toilet goes out, the contingency plan on a space mission, if the toilet isn't working, is the, um, the old fecal bag, which is just a bag, really, with an adhesive ring, and you have to, uh, because it's zero gravity and you're not gonna have good separation, you gotta, like, Absolutely. coaxing it, it's a horrible situation, you don't. <laughs> so the people who make that toilet and that's not easy to make a zero gravity toilet, a whole different principle. Those people are, are, are really, they're um, contributing more than you would right. imagine to. They're uh, heroes. They're really. heroes. They're heroes it's, of, yeah. of the space Everybody industry. Everybody thinks the astronaut is the hero, but it's the no. waste management yeah. people who are the Anyone can be an key. astronaut. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but can you design a toilet? A that, toilet that's gonna work without gravity. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So uh, when you're at a dinner party, do these things come up? No one invites me to dinner parties oh. anymore. <laughs> don't bring her. No, no. make She's her sit start in the talking kitchen. About gross things. Yeah, no, I don't. And often I'm, I, I, I'll do uh, not often, but every now and then somebody invites me to either a, a breakfast event or a lunch event, and I'm always you just see people putting down their silverware. Like, oh, and you're like, well, it, when. Uh, you were on Terry Gross last week, two uh, weeks ago, yes. or whenever this was a fresh yes. air. Uh, I don't know if I've ever heard Terry Gross <gasps> yeah. talk about the difference between male and female farts. Farts, And yeah. that yeah. is a direct, you know, 
uh, result of, of your research. And I could hear you on the other end. You were like completely <laughs> laughing. You were in like, you were like just so happy. It that, is, that Terry it, it Gross is. was kind of befuddled by the well, the difference in the sexes of well, the Well, first latest. of all, just, you I mean, for me, I mean, I've never been on fresh air in, in the right. 10 years I've been writing books. So just getting there was pretty spectacular. But getting Terry Gross not to, to discuss that, and also we were, there was part of the conversation had had to do with a chapter in Gulp that's set at Avenal State Prison, which has to do with hooping, which is smuggling things through the hoop right, right. rectally. So she's, I got to hear the, the you know, the, the classic, unmistakable Terry Gross voice saying, so you spent some time with, with people who practice something called hooping. <laughs> no, and I was just like, this is really some kind of high point in my life. Just. <laughs> it was, I'm sure it made her day. Um, no, it's, she, it was, yeah, she was, uh, such a, she was a tremendously good sport. And I also, uh, uh, on a bet, I, I managed to, um, I, 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 I had this bet and the challenge was to get to an opportun get an opportunity to say at one point, Terry Gross. <laughs> <laughs> and I did it. I did it. Awesome. I did it. Um, she didn't notice, she, probably. She, <laughs> she, or did she? She said, well, she, at one point she asked a question, and this did not make it into the interview. She said, have you ever had... Have you ever had a, like a growth on your body or a rash or something that you, you just looked at yourself and you thought, how did I produce this disgusting thing? And, and I'm like, this is it. And I went, Terry, gross. <laughs> um, that was cut. That was cut. That was cut. That was cut. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Terry. <laughs> So it, it, what has changed in your approach to your material over, over time, over the books? Do you, I noticed this uh, book, there's a, there's a lot of footnotes. It seemed more footnotes than... Bonk holds the record for Bonk footnotes. Bonk has the it's record for Bonk, it, yeah, it, the, the more footnotes there are, it's just, it, that, that's just a situation where there's so much fun material and I can't work it all in. Yeah. And there were just so many places where like, this doesn't really belong in the chapter, but I'm not putting it in anyway. And so right. that's when it becomes a footnote. I think the, so, uh, the Beano visit and the jacket actually are in a footnote. They are in a, yeah. yes, they are. They are because in a Because that is too good to. Yeah, the, the Beano windbreaker is in there. They also sponsored a hot air balloon race. <laughs> Big balloon Beano. That's somebody That's really some, working hard in publicity. That is some That's, creative marketing. That <laughs> is going really on. good. Yeah. That is really good. So, but it doesn't really change how you approach it, uh, uh, or or do you feel that you you get more comfortable talking to scientists, or um, do you feel it, more like you you research, you have even more facts at your disposal for each book, or? N you, you know, it's got it gets easier in that people have heard of. I mean, and that could work, that could go in both directions. Mm -hmm. I was a little concerned that after Stiff came out, no one would want to speak to me just because, you know, they, you know they, as a scientist, maybe you want someone to sort of take your work very seriously and be very thorough and present it in a lot of detail. And you don't really get that with, with me. <laughs> you, get, you get what you get. But right. anyway, but people have been, um, now that more people are familiar with my work, they're like, oh yeah, Mary Roach, sure. You can come to the lab, which is always amazing to me that somebody would, even regardless of who I am, the fact that people are so, scientists are incredibly generous with their time, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not just interviewing them, I'm using them as unpaid tutors. Like, I'll sit down, you know, like for Packing for Mars, saying, okay, cosmic radiation, what is it? Mm -hmm. what, where's it coming from? What, just start me at the beginning. You know, so it's hours later, these poor people. <laughs> right. But, you know, not that many people ask them those questions. That is also true. Their, their wives are so sick of hearing about it. Their kids don't give a shit. They're so... Um, they're they're desperate is, in a way to yeah, unload like, all of this knowledge yes, in a way. Yeah. I, I, I sat down. There was a guy for Gulp, uh, Andres Vanderbilt, and he he's a physicist, and he studied chewing and the forces of chewing and which is more interesting than you would think and he but he's just so used to people like glazing over and walking away that he started talking about he was telling me about how you know when if you're you're biting down on a peanut and the second that the peanut gives way your muscles cut out because if they kept pushing that hard you'd break your teeth so there's this automatic like cut off right reflex that's amazing and then he anybody would stop himself and go 
I don't know if you want to hear this. You know, it's just very like, right. do you, is this what you want to hear? Because yeah. he's so used to people going, right. That's oh a point God, Andres is, uh, yeah. is going to talk about chewing again. Yeah, right. <laughs> Right. You know, but I'm like, wow, that is cool. Because people think that pe the jaw and the teeth are known for being super strong. Everyone's like, oh, pound for pound, the strongest muscle in the body, all that. But they're very sensitive. And so right. to me, it was fascinating that there's these really subtle, sensitive things going on under the radar in, in your mouth all the time. So he was just, like, he, was so, he was so excited. And, and you're coming all this way to talk to me? Like, what's the catch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, the, but uh, they must be proud that you know, you're reading their work. I mean, they're, they're publishing in yeah. these uh, medical journals, right. so not a lot of circulation. Right. The general public doesn't really, isn't yeah. really aware of what they do, and, and you're able to like, bring them you know, to a larger audience. Yeah. They, yeah, for the most part, they're kind of tickled, which is nice. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, let's talk about, uh, oh, I have a note here. You know, as I read your book, I just wrote down notes, and um, I don't know if you know this or not, <laughs> but it came to mind as I was reading Gulf. Okay. Uh, what is the nutritional value of human vomit? I don't know. It just came Wait, to mind. Wait, that, well, that's a silly question. It depends on what you ate. It depends right. on what you're throwing up. Right. But there, uh, you're mentioning... What do you mean, you uh, mean like, would you, would you get less nutrition having taken it into the stomach? I mean, I guess how long you, has it been in the stomach before you throw it see, up? See, I didn't think it through, did I? This is like... <laughs> no. You're just raising more <laughs> questions than... I can answer. But there is there is a uh, a it, portion of gulp that I identified with very strongly, which was uh, autocoprophagia. Oh, okay. You're, the traditional value of shit. You're right. asking. You, that's what you wanted to say. Right. Well, I, I thought I saw the shit, and then I thought, <laughs> well, what? Maybe what is vomit? You know. I, well, vomit would have more nutritional value because it's right. been less broken down. Right. So, but, dog. When a dog eats somebody, another dog's vomit. It's basically just changed form. It's, still, it's very fresh and not right. broken down, and you, you wouldn't lose a lot of nutrients. It right. would be a little, the taste would be right. altered right. a little. But the, uh, the, the, but. the autocoprophagia, you go into great, uh, <clears throat> great detail about animals Great that, as in great. Uh, animals, yeah. that, <laughs> animals that eat their own feces and uh, the feces of other animals. Well, and, with, and how yeah. nutritious it with, actually really is, with which was shocking. That was... Yeah, rodents, rabbits are, are famous shit eaters because right. okay, it, they, they, famous. Fa well, like they are worldwide. they are eating it as it comes out as a matter of course. It is and and people who raise rabbits, it's not called coprophagia. It's they're called cecotrophs. They've given them a nice name. Cecotrophs. So the, the first it, it, there's the first round pellet, which is then eaten, and then there's the second round pellet mm -hmm. because uh, what's going on is that it, in the colon. A further breakdown is creating vitamins that the colon isn't set up to absorb. So the um, rabbit eats it again, and then it's like go, on the second run through, it, it, the small intestine can absorb it. So they, they if you prevent, and what, how this all was discovered, there was this guy, Richard Henry Barnes, and he was studying nutrition. He was a Cornell nutritionist, and he was studying with rodents. Okay, and he was he he was very frustrated by the menu substitutions of his rodents because they, they kept eating their shit and he's like I don't want to study shit eating I want to study this so he tried to he prevented them by creating this little funny outfit which it's, a, 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 it's like, like a, a little, little leather jacket and yeah. but that's a whole other thing but it's a leather jacket though that the, that the rodent wears it's a restraining yeah. yeah so anyway he tried to prevent the rodents from eating their own pellets and they became malnourished and they lost weight and he realized for certain for certain animals that right. they that is um that's like a vitamin pellet right you you eat that right you eat that yeah right no i uh, and other animals as well i um, i had a dog that used to do that because yeah. he was a laboratory uh test animal a beagle yeah and it is really one of the most disgusting things uh, you yeah. could ever see to you to you as yeah. you know it's still but warm not to him. it's steaming it's to, in the cold air yes there was okay this, um, there was, um, there's a paper, there's a paper about... <laughs> you know, it's, it's still light out, everyone okay. outside, just so you know. Okay, you, the, you mentioned it's, the, it's still steaming. This is, okay. Um, I, I, there are... <laughs> there's a fun fact coming. 
Okay. I can't wait. You can't. Gorilla, gorillas. There's a paper on gorilla. gorillas and coprophagia in gorillas. Mm -hmm. And um, the researcher was trying to figure out, you know, well, why were they, you know, why are they doing this? Are they, are they trying to get some sort of nutrition from it? Or what, what would be? And one of the things they wondered is because it was, this was in that particular time that it was observed, it was cold. And the, the researcher theorized that maybe they just wanted something warm, like cream of wheat or something. <laughs> Cream Something of wheat. warm to eat. I, I don't. Cream of ape. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyway, wow. So. Yeah, we're uh, we're we're it getting is, into yes. it now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here, the 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 thing I no, I also notice <laughs> is that the, the, all the subjects you write about, uh, there, there is, you know, contemporary newsworthiness to some degree, but there is this <clears throat> incredible sort of. Uh, a swath of historical quackery that you love to go into in yeah. each one of these subjects. And it's, it's, it's bizarre to see how wrong scientists can be, really. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, how and how widespread the, the beliefs are. There was, right. yeah. What is the, uh, the, 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 give the example in Gulp of the guy who has the open stomach. Oh, the, the, yeah, the, the fistulated stomach. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Right, but That's what, what was the What was the myth, though? Uh, well, it just—it didn't. It's, it seemed just like an incredibly crude medical procedure, oh, and the relationship between right. these two guys. Right, right. Well, um, yeah, it was a, a, a trapper in 1822. Is a 18-year-old fur trapper who was shot accidentally in his side. It blew open a hole in his stomach, and to his rescue comes the local army surgeon uh, William Beaumont, who because Beaumont. there's a um, there's a military garrison near the fur trading post, so. He takes this boy in and thinks he's going to die. The boy survives. The, the hole doesn't heal entirely. It's a what's called a gastrocutaneous fistula. It, it heals, but it heals open. And William Beaumont, a light bulb goes off at a certain point. <laughs> William Beaumont is a man who, he's very driven career-wise. Mm -hmm. he, he's out, he's like some podunk military doctor and he wants to make his name. And at one point he realizes, when the lad lies upon his side, I can peer into the hole and I can see human digestion in action. And then he gets the idea, well, if I got a little mesh bag on a silk string and I put different types of food into the stomach and I can see how long does it take to digest certain things? Will they digest outside the body? Will they, does the weather affect it? I mean, for t years and years, hundreds of experiments. Right. Uh, he ended up paying uh, St. Martin for, uh, he was sort of a houseboy slash digester <laughs> machine <laughs> kind of your, and your, was uh, really your, yeah. other duties as assigned kind of right. thing. Um, but it was actually not, it was not so much quackery as just cr kind of a create, I mean, given that Beaumont was not forced to do it, he was, I right. mean, St. Martin was paid, he wasn't held against his will. It was a, a very, cr a kind of a creative approach to seeing what is going on inside the stomach. There had been researchers in the 1600s and Italian researchers who'd been curious about that and the way they did it was um, to eat food themselves and then wait a while and make themselves throw up. So it was sort of bulimia in the service of science. So they, you know, Beaumont was, uh, he was getting at the same question, it was just he realized this is a way to, right. uh, to um, do it without but throwing it, up. But they, uh, the, the, the fur trapper and the doctor uh, remained sort of medical partners for... For 30 years. 30 yeah, no, years. it was a very sort of um, coyote and roadrunner because uh, <laughs> St. Saint Martin had a drinking problem. St. Martin would take off and, and disappear and, you know, then, like, go broke from drinking too much and somebody would run into him and, and let Beaumont know. Of course, this was all by letters being carried. I mean, this is, you know, it wasn't by email. And then finally somebody would, you know, get a note to St. Martin saying, hey, he's offering you $500 to come and be his stomach again. And um, so he'd come back and then he'd run away again and Beaumont would be so pissed off. And Beaumont had this real sense of, that, you know, that St. Martin should realize that it's his duty as a, f as an owner of a fistulated stomach that he should see as his calling the furthering of science. Well, St. Martin was a, you know, he's a, an illiterate fur trapper who's right. got a, you know, a bunch of kids and he doesn't give a crap about no, he just science. Has a hole in his he's just, yeah. he's got a hole in his stomach and I think he's kind of like, well, fur trapping is pretty, it's hard labor being out and, you know, the stomach thing, it's not pleasant. I don't really like Beaumont, but it's easier and he's paying me. So you could see him kind of like going back and forth. Yeah. Gets yeah. money to drink. No, that's like fascinating. Uh, so uh, another 
uh, person makes an appearance in, in Gulp, uh, Elvis Presley. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you write, has a, had a colon that was yes. two to three times yes. larger than... Than it should have been. Than it, than than he, it should than have been. Than the average person. Yeah, he had a mega colon. He had a mega, a mega colon. colon. Elvis Presley struggled with constipation. Right. Uh, seriously. I you mean, know, we on don't the road, think we, of that. No. You think of the swiveling of the hips. You don't think of a guy being constipated. No, it, it, no you don't. And, uh, uh, and, and it's unclear whether... Okay, I mean, he, he, what, he definitely had that condition, and he right. definitely died of a heart arrhythmia, straining on the toilet. But mm-hmm. what caused this condition, you know, the prescription drugs, I mean, it's on a, an amazing menu of prescription drugs and, and pain, you know, painkillers will right. completely stop your gut and psychiatric meds will also slow things down. So that wasn't helping. There's also a thought he might've had something called Hirschsprungs, which is where a portion of your colon doesn't have any nerves, so it doesn't squeeze stuff along. So you get these backups and the colon stretches out and when it stretches out, it, the muscles don't work right. So it kind of snowballs. And so, yeah, it was, he, you know, his motto was TCB, right. taking care of business, right. took on another kind of dimension. <laughs> but it was, I, I, spent a, I spent a day with his doctor, uh, his Dr. Doctor. Nick. Yeah, Dr. His Nick. His doctor, that is such a great yeah. scene in your book. You're sitting in the living room of Elvis Presley's personal doctor the house talking that, about constipation. Yes. Yes. It, it's fascinating. <laughs> the house that Elvis gave him. That's in right. The, in, yeah, in the 70s. And uh, yeah, uh, it was uh, yeah one of those scenes that just uh, his daughter was there and his wife and every now and then his wife was named Edna and and um, she didn't say very much but at one point I, I said did you ever talk to Priscilla about whether she knew whether Elvis as a boy had this problem and and he said no we she didn't want to comment on that and and then at one point Edna said she just goes and sticks her nose in everything <laughs> just like the out of the blue uh, Priscilla Presley comment. <laughs> A little touchy. A little touchy. Touchy about it, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but anyway, he, it was an, an interesting afternoon. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I, yeah, I thought that was, um, that was, that was fascinating. Um, so uh, how does this book change your own diet and digestion? Have you thought about it? Do you think no, about it? No, you know it? what this book, the, the, what happens with my books has happened with Bonk, the sex lab book as well. There's a period of time when you're, when you're reading about the intricacies of the biological, physiological process when you start to become aware of things that you don't want to be really aware of, either whether it's when you're having sex or you're, when you're eating, whatever it is, you just you don't really want to think about yourself as an organism doing something right. and what's happening in your body. It's kind of distracting and strange. That's why we have doctors. Yes, right. We don't have yeah. to think about it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. The, so what, I had a, yeah, the oral processing in particular, I, I was, because I'd come across a statistic like, the minimum number of chews required to ready a McVitie's digestive biscuit for swallow is eight. So I'd be like, I, I bet I can do it in seven. I think I can do it in seven. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just would be, um, or just, just conscious of like uh, intraoral bolus rolling, or like, oh yeah, you do kind of, you put it up against the cheek and you roll it over and yeah, what is, yeah, yeah. What, what is intraoral bolus rolling? Well, okay. <laughs> it sounds like a... Sp- Sporting event. It's in Canada. Like curl, I think yeah, it's curling. It. it sounds like something like they Canadian do in the, thing. in the winter in Canada. No offense to our friends yeah. from the north. Uh, it was well, a bo- the bolus is the, you know when you you chew food and you take it apart and then you need to put it back together. That's right. you're putting it into the bolus. It's just a cylindrical, saliva moistened mass. So it's and cylindrical. Then, it's not a ball. No, it's not I a ball. I keep thinking bolus would be a round. No, it's a, it's a it's it's cylindrical. Like a pencil. Yeah, sort of. Sort of, yes. Fatter, yes. fatter, softer. Fatter and softer. So that's yeah. every bite we swallow is a bolus. It's a, we, you swallow a bolus. That's right. Uh, uh, I don't want to think about that. No, sorry. Now you will. The sol- yeah. Oh. Yeah. I thought it was a little ball. That would be easy to kind of imagine going down, but it's no, actually it's, this. No, it's and and it all tube <laughs> of mush. Yeah. So Ugh. there's the the bolus that you. So uh, what is yeah. the intraoral? Ro- oh, intraoral, just in, in the mouth. Intra, inside right. the mouth, inside the mouth. But you kind mouth. of roll it around as so we... You're, yeah, you're forming it. And th- there's really, really off-putting videos of it, this kind of stuff. And yeah. the journal articles for oral processing are just... There's one photo um, with... It's, it's like four different photos over time. And the caption is like photos of spat out custard to which black dye has been added. I mean, it's just... It, it is just the weirdest... Yeah. World. Uh, it's kind of odd to just sit down for dinner and go, you know, never mind. 
you know, you wouldn't even understand what I what I just saw yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a pair of uh, mylar <laughs> fart collecting pants. Flata strapping yeah. pantaloons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be difficult to just sort of. Uh, when people ask you in the course of your research, what do you say? Well, how's the book going? What have you seen so far? And you know, I never talk about it because taken out, well, uh, until the book is out, right. I don't really talk about it because taken out of context, it just sounds like dumb. Uh, it's uh, weird and stupid, but all of these things, are, they're in the context of something that makes sense. Right. So they're, um, they're, too, they're almost too random and too, I, d I don't talk about what I'm doing very much when I'm doing it. But it's, so it's like, they're like little silent victories you have. Little yeah. silent, uh, you get to silently champion something and, and enjoy it just for yourself. Well, for and also, uh, there's always that moment where you, you I mean, you know, you're familiar with this, where there's a moment in your reporting where you think, this is gonna be so fun to write up. It's just gonna be fun to write about. Right. And, and sometimes the most embarrassing and awkward things are the things that you know. I mean, even though it's embarrassing and awkward, like the bonk scene the, the, where I was a subject, in a sex study, that, that was really embarrassing and awkward, and I don't really recommend that to anybody as a way to spend mm -hmm. your afternoon, but I was at the time thinking this will be so yeah. fun to write <laughs> this up. Great material. Great material. This is gonna be great this material. This is great material. So what was, what was that moment in Gulp where you realized this is gonna be so fun to write? I, I think the, uh, the afternoon at Avenal State Prison with the, um, the Hoopers, the Hoopers. The Hoopers. Right. The Hoopers. So uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about that and why that's included in this. Because yeah. I think uh, this is about the elementary canal, and we're talking about uh, prisoners well, shoving things up okay. their anus. Yeah, it's a chapter. Well, it's the, it's the rectum chapter. Oh, okay. right. So uh, I needed I needed. Don't some fast forward. Start from the beginning. <laughs> I needed some kind of a... I wanted a kind of a narrative that would, would address... Um, the rectum, which is a storage facility. So the Hoopers are using the rectum for the purpose for which it evolved, which is it's a storage facility. Right. Uh, and also I wanted to talk about the defecation reflex, and which is something that you override all the time, that you can, th and thank goodness for that, that you can override that reflex. I thank God yeah, every thank, day. I do should, everybody should. So, everybody uh, should. Everybody should be thankful for that. <laughs> Manual override of the be, defecation uh, reflex. It would be a hell of a society it if would. we didn't have that. It would. There'd be bathrooms everywhere. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, these guys who are packing stuff that way, right. uh, and sometimes if you're detained for any, uh, under suspicion of smuggling, you uh, are ha it's a test. It's a test of wills. Like, you, and this people in caught in airports who are smuggling stuff using the alimentary canal as a criminal accomplice. Uh, they are having to really fight the uh, the urge. And they're, like, I was curious about what are the limits of that, and how is it that the body keeps you know does it ever burst? And so I had a lot of questions that the these right. people could uh, had a unique perspective right. upon. So the prisoners. So, uh, I, uh, let me think if I can remember this in the book. They uh, they they smuggle things into prison. Mm -hmm. So uh, they they're actually smuggling. their friend they're, brings they're going, it in. Well, this what's, way. they're they're often they're going. Um, in the case of Avenal Prison, a lot of them work on a, it's a chicken farm, and so they they, they are handed off um, egg shaped often tobacco bundles and sometimes cell phones, and then they which they put in they hoop. So they, they hoop, hoop and then they go back into the prison and kind of lay that stuff like the eggs they work with all day. So they- It's kind uh, they, of magical. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, the, but, the, but it, it was, to me what was, inter it was just to spend time, I mean, what a strange way to be introduced to someone. I mean, I, I you know, when I, when I wrote to the, pr the, the public affairs office, the California, I wrote to the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation and I said, I tried to explain myself as best I could. Uh, and I said, I'm interested in the, you know, the elementary canal as a criminal accomplice and smuggling contraband. And, and I got this note back and he said, well, yeah, we have a big problem with cell phone smuggling at Avenal State Prison. Cell and phones, because cell phones, people uh, Because you, their... gang leaders can um, do business from within. They can right. order hits or whatever they need to do right. on a cell phone. So you're not, they're not allowed to have cell phones. So, but he, but the guy at the PR office said, because it's just a fact of life there, he said, yeah, sure, we can set you up with an interview with somebody who's quite known for this, and would four hours be enough time? To talk about, And I'm like, uh, to yeah. talk to a stranger about his rectum? Yeah, I think so. 
if you need I more, we so. can get more, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, wow. But but uh, and it turned out he was uh, he was uh, it was you know he, it, it, prison is boring is the bottom line. And so for this, he's in he's in for life. He was in for murder. And so yeah. some woman wants to talk about rectal smuggling. Yeah, sure. Why not? I don't know. Sure. So can I ask you this? Did the interview go all four hours? <laughs> no. No, it didn't. <laughs> no. It I think didn't. it'd run out of after a while. Yeah, like a half an hour. I think it was 35 yeah. minutes. Point made. But right. Covered the, the basics. All yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. So on that note, um, why don't we take it out to you, the audience. <laughs> if you have any questions at all for Mary Roach about this book or any of her other books or uh, intraoral bolus rolling <laughs> or hooping, um, you must have some questions. Oh, yes. I mean, there's, Mary, I have your first question over one. here. Who selects the titles of your books? Uh, I do, I do, but we always go back and forth with the publisher. Um, the, all of my books, it's been the title that I had on the pr book proposal and I always assumed I would change it and I never came up with anything better, but uh, they're all my fault. Except the space book you mentioned. The space, well that, that is my fault, but we, that was not one, we couldn't come up with a, one word for the space book. There just wasn't something that suggested the human experience of zero gravity and, and space. And it, I had one, but it was terrible. Tell them. Yeah. Um, I wanted, I suggested calling it floaters. Because <laughs> I thought it works on a couple levels. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not thinking NASA, though, when I no, hear that. No, yeah. no, that got next, <laughs> thankfully, thankfully. Next question's on your left. Uh, hi, you've sort of neg neglected to say much about the middle part of the digestive tract, and I have a question about what makes those weird noises that we sometimes make when we're digesting? Uh, you know uh, those noises uh, yes. I mean? Yes, you, know you know what, there's a word that I love, They're called, it's called borborygmy. Borborygmy is intestinal gurglings. Borborig, the singular is borborygmus. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's just uh, the liquid and stuff kind of moving back and being you know being squeezed around back and forth and it's that's I, that's the best answer I have. I don't know that there's I don't have I'm sure that there's you know I, I should have gotten it. There's probably a whole paper on borborygmy that there's I should a, have. Uh, yeah. I should have, uh, but I don't have a, I don't have anything more specific other than the name. There's Borbury. probably a doctor in Amsterdam somewhere, though. Is that right. Who hits the, all the goods. Okay, next question. Same place up here on the left. So I have a question about the subtitle of the book. Uh, given yeah. the fact that the alimentary canal is just one long tube, yeah. right? Why isn't it adventures in the alimentary canal, not on the elementary canal. Because I was trying to reference that song, six, what is it, 18 years on the Erie Canal. I, I wanted it to be like adventures on, like traveling on the Nile. I right. wanted it to feel like a vacation, like a cruise. <laughs> like you're actually traveling down on a, on a, it is. On a river boat. <laughs> so. That's, that's why, but, but there was debate back and forth, not b between in and on, but along and on. Someone at my publisher thought it should be along the alimentary canal. But anyway, I was trying to evoke travel and <laughs> excitement, foreign locales. I think on works better than along. I do, thank you. The I along sounds like a banjo I song. Actually, it, I you actually know, did, a, kind of <laughs> I did a Google uh, hit for Along the Nile and on the Nile, along the, and anyway, there's a lot more ons than along, so I, so, I won. Strength yeah. in numbers. But people say in a lot. You're not alone in that. There's I one do. over here. People say in. Yeah, next question is here. Um, hi. I, I think of you as a historian as well as a science writer, so I just wanted, do you read history? Do you think of yourself that way? I, I, love, I love history. I don't. I, I would never be able to do, because I'm, I'm not a historian by training, I can't see doing an entire history of something also, because there'd be that, um, the pressure to be thorough and cover the whole scope of, and cover everything, and I'm a little hopscotching around, but when I do find something that works, some like Horace Fletcher and Fletcherizing, that was just so much fun to dive into that. I went to Harvard where his letters are, and spent the afternoon reading through the Fletcher, the Fletcher papers. So I'm kind of a, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a wannabe historian. I love, I love history. Yeah. yeah. 
Next question's in the front. Yeah, I, uh, on the subject of your uh, subtitle, I just thought you, I'd like to know that the great uh, humorist Robert Benchley once wrote a book called Along the Alimentary Canal with Gun and Camera. Yes, I've seen that. Yes, Along the Alimentary, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, with Gun and along Camera. Along the Alimentary Canal with Gun and Camera, I've seen, there's, a, yeah, yep, yep. But he's dead, so you, you didn't have to pay any royalties. Dead, for this. no. He'll never know, no. We have another question up here. Uh, yeah, who do you read? Who do I read? Um, I, a couple of my, the writers that I hold dear and feel like influenced me to a certain extent are um, uh, Bill Bryson. I love his way of incorporating fact, history, science, and humor. The man cannot write a stale sentence. Just, just an amazing writer, and you learn so much, but it's always, you're laughing. He's, he's, he's where, you know, on my, on my best day, reaching as high as I can, I could touch the bottom of his pants cuff, I don't know. So, uh, and Susan Orlean, I also love, I don't care what she, I don't, I didn't have a lot of interest in Rin Tin Tin. I never saw the show, but I read that whole book, and I, anything she would, Right, I, lo I, love her, I love her stuff. And, and a lot of different New Yorker writers. Burkhardt Bilger, who wrote the piece on Mars in this week's New Yorker, I love his writing. He, he writes, he's a, a, he doesn't always write about science, but frequently, and just a beautiful writer. Uh, so he's another one. Robert Sullivan, who wrote that wonderful book on rats. Did you ever read? No, I didn't, uh, I didn't, yeah. I didn't I'm not aware of that, but. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Rats are interesting. <laughs> we have another question up here in the back. Yeah. There was a recent article about human coprophagia. I don't know if you've read it. No. It was a way of curing some sort of intestinal disease by oh. having... Okay, fecal transplants. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, yeah, yeah. You're not actually eating it, it's going in the back door. Um, but it, 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 is, it is a very effective, a fecal transplant, this is a cure. A chapter in the book. Yeah, I, I was in um, Minneapolis with a doctor who was, who was doing one, and uh, it, it, there's inf if you have an infection with something called C. difficile, it's a bacteria that can be antibiotic resistant, and once it's in there, it's really hard to get it out, and you have a lot of uh, chronic diarrhea. 30,000 people die a year in the United States from chronic C. diff infection, and an almost instant cure is to take a healthy donor's feces, basically, throw it in an Oster blender, and it's Oster, and the Oster people don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I asked. <laughs> um, and it's put in, uh, it, it's sort of like immigration from one colon to another. It's put in with a colonoscope. Uh, I think that there are, is a way to do it endos endoscopally, anyway, from this direction. But when I, the one that I saw, it was, you just have a plunger attachment on the same device that is used to do a colonoscopy. It's a very simple 10-minute, procedure that is 90% um, cure rate. Uh, and It's amazing. And it I mean, is it, amazing, I, I yeah. remember that, that, that's a vivid, of course, uh, chapter that you yeah. describe because it's so disgusting uh, to, to well, it, imagine yeah. like f a feces from another human Indeed, going up yeah. inside you. And but yet the, 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 right. you realize it's a complete um, uh, medical procedure. And it works. Right, and it, and it works. And, and it, it's, it was interesting. The chapter is called The Ick Factor because I was interested in has the Ick Factor held back acceptance of this technique? Because it's been done for years and years. It's, not, it's been known about the first fecal transplant was done, I think, in the 50s. I, ben Eisenman. I, I don't have the date. Right? It's in the book. But, but anyway, the, 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 the idea has been around for a long time. But part of it is also that to get something into the healthcare system, you know, normally there's a pharmaceutical company or a device maker, and it's just shit. So, you know, yeah. nobody's funding what it takes to get it sort right. of in place, and right. how do you bill for it? You know, right. what do you charge for shit? You know. Right. So it's been slow going, but there, it, the media that has covered it quite a bit, and so now people are starting to, you know, right. it, it's lost kind of the electrical charge that it had. I mean, when I first started the book, people would be like. Oh my God! You're kidding! How could that? That should be illegal. You know, I was like, no, no, no. Actually, it works really well. Yeah. So now there's been more, a lot more acceptance. Right. Yeah. But there's no home kit for it. Um, like you have there's to. There's not. Like, no, but people have. There's a there's a paper on DIY that's in. I, I'm not no, recommending this. No. You're serious. No. There's a paper where. Oh. 
Oh, so, but the, uh, the, 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 the clinic that you, uh, that you follow in doing this, uh, the guy doesn't know what to charge the patient, the doctor. No, no, he Be just charges for a colonoscopy because there's no, and, and, the, and the, the, they've used the same donor. It's just this guy, it seems to work. They don't, and they don't know which bacteria it is. It's just like this guy's stuff seems to work. <laughs> so, you know, he shows up at nine in the morning. He came with a, like a brown paper bag and he hands it off. It's winter, he's wearing a big parka and boots. And he, he said, not my best work. <laughs> But, it, but in fact, it worked. So, oh. <laughs> anyway, There's yes, a, sorry. Another one yeah. over here. Hi, I'm not sure if this is covered in your book, but I was wondering about, um, I remember reading about Gandhi and he would drink his own urine. And I always wondered about the, the benefits of that and if you know anything about that. Um, actually, I would covered that a little bit in Packing for Mars, but not uh, in terms of it being beneficial. The astronauts, uh, uh, you can treat, you can take urine and treat it such that it's basically drinking water. But uh, there's an Ayurvedic practice of drinking one's own urine, and I don't know what it purports to do for one other than ruin one's breakfast. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. The, the short answer is I don't know. Quench the thirst. What it, yeah. yeah. Um, they mean, you, you, I actually sampled, uh, you, you can get a kit where you're sort of replacing salt with sugar, so it's very, very sweet. There's a lot of salts in urine, and if you're stuck in the desert, it's not the ideal beverage because you're taking in a lot of salt. Um, but it's pretty easy to, to, to treat it and make it essentially water. Um, but you're talking about something different, like a medical use of it, and that I don't know. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I know a lot about Gandhi's feces, but not the, uh, <laughs> uh, no. I, I wanted to ask, this, this brings it up, uh, have you, what was the grossest thing you personally did in researching this book? And did you oh. include it in the book? Oh, did, what the grossest thing, did I do anything? Did I, what did I do that was, uh, I, I embarrassed myself by failing on the tryouts for the UC Davis olive oil flavor panel. Um, I, that was embarrassing. Um, I, I put my, I, uh, there's a fistulated cow at UC Davis, which is an extraordinary, it's a, the rumen, the cow's rumen is this great big fermenting vat. And you can put your arm all the way up to the shoulder and still not reach the bottom. And it's a kind of extraordinary. Um, and this is the stomach of a cow. It's the, well, this cow has a series of right. stomachs. The rumen is the, the big one, the main one. Which is and it, it works. It's like a composter. It's different than the human stomach. It's not acid-based. It's bacterial breakdown. So it's this. It's hot in there, and it's packed with, you know, chewed-up grain. And it's, it's. Did you have a glove on? Or I something? did have a. I did have okay. a a, a very an, a nice curious. shoulder-length plastic glove, which is more commonly used by artificial inseminators. Right. Yeah. It's a, but it's all an the way up to the shoulder. Glove. This one was up yeah. to the shoulder. Yeah. yeah. We have time for a couple more questions. Okay. Next one is right here to your right. Okay. There. Um, I assume the book has, since I haven't read it yet, has something about all these different, like celiac disease, all of these different autoimmune things. What was the most kind of strange thing that you learned about that subject? Actually, the the book is about the healthy equipment, so I don't go I don't go off into diseases of the digestive tract or or nutrition because it would be a six volume set. There's so, and it. Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a um, m more based, on, and even the fecal transplant chapter was really more about the microbiome, the bacteria of the gut. It wasn't so much a chapter about C. difficile infection. So I don't, I don't have much, I'm not a, a celiac expert, but I, there are whole books that somebody's just got a whole celiac diet. The guy who did the South Beach diet now has a gluten diet. I keep running into him at, in inter TV stations. Oh, really? oh, there's that. There's the gluten. Hello, gluten guy. Hi. Yeah. Hi, I'm the elementary <laughs> canal person. Hello, Hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a question over here? Yes, we do. Hi, with a book concerned with digestion, um, kind of like within my known lifetime, it just seems as though there's such a proliferation of promotion of what yogurt can do for, in the aid of digestion. Do you find that that, like what have you been finding in terms of that, in terms of like scientific proof or studies, and is it supported? Right. Like their claims. Right, like probiotic claims. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, the thing with probiotics, uh, I, I, because the, the, the fecal transplant chapter was really my bacteria uh, of the 
digestive tract chapter, I asked the, the uh, gastroenterologist about specifically capsules you know, for um, probiotics. And I said, what is in those capsules exactly? And he said, marketing. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, but, but to be fair though, um, lactobacillus, which is the, the, com, the, the bacteria that you hear about in yogurt, yeah, that's actually um, lactobacillus suppositories are, are useful for yeast infections. I'm told that that's actually a, a very, that's one of the rare probiotic uses that, that seems to be effective. Not, not so much eating it, but putting it you know, where the problem is. So um, if just uh, eating, you know, the, the stomach, one of the, the, the functions of gastric acid is to kill bacteria. So you've got you've to you know, be putting it in something that's going to survive the stomach. You've got to have enough of it in there to overwhelm like, the g -g -g gazillions that are in the, I mean, a, I mean, a fecal transplant is a cup and a half of stuff. So it's kind of questionable um, how effective it would be. I, I spoke to the... Um, the head of research at the, uh, the Center for Research and Development in Probiotics in Canada, he said 95% of the products on the market being touted as probiotics should not be called that because they haven't been tested in humans. There's, there's no evidence. Um, and so they're, but you know, it's, it, it's one of those, if, if you think it makes you feel better, then there's no harm done, I guess. But, but Jamie there's not Lee a- Jamie Curtis is advertising it. Uh, yeah. You know, how can um, it be bad? Right, but the, but the people who are involved in, in really uh, doing work with transplanting of um, intestinal bacteria and uh, things like that are not huge. Um, they're not, they're, they're a little, um, take a bit of a dim view on a lot of the products that are out there. Right, yep. probiotic. Yeah. I'm gonna take this opportunity to ask the last question here. Um, so I, I get seasick often and, and car sick too. And I'm always wondering how I can reduce it or whether or not it's better before I go on the boat to, to eat a little something or I should go on with an empty stomach. I've heard you're supposed to have, uh, you're supposed to eat something. It's better to, it's better to eat something. And when I, I did, not from this book, from, from Packing for Mars, I was on the Vomit Comet, which does this roller coaster flight. And, it, and that combined with the zero gravity and then the double gravity, people, really, it's, it's a serious, uh, does a number on you, uh, and the, they um, make sure that you've eaten something. You definitely want to have eaten something. And there's also, the, there's also drugs. They give, you yeah. good, they give you good drugs. They give you scopolamine mixed with dexedrine, and only one person got sick. I'm the kind of person, I couldn't watch Beasts of the Southern Wild because it was to the handheld. I'm just looking at the floor going, tell me when it's over. So I, like you, I get sick, but um, I, uh, I, I, I was okay on that. So, eat something. Eat I something. will. Eat something. I will eat something. Okay. And speaking of which, we have some cookies and reception at the book signing afterwards. Nice segue, Brian. <laughs> Boom. Very classy. <laughs> Thank you, audience. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Mary. We'll see you in the atrium. <laughs>